Hi, folks. This is Dave Hoover. Well, welcome to the webinar today. Uh, it's on the topic of disaggregation, which is getting more and more play in the literature and our discussions in the soils realm. Uh, it's really been discussed as far as uh, the concept of spatially or uh, locating all of the components of map units that we find out in the field, being able to better identify to the users of soil surveys where all the different parts, landscape and soil characteristic-wise, are within our broader, broad map, uh, map units. Well, that's been going on as long as I've been involved in soil survey, and, and uh, now I think we have an ability to start taking a closer look at it. So what this webinar will do is provide more of a common definition of the terms that you're going to be hearing more and more over the, over the next couple of years as we move into, into another phase of, of soil survey. The priority of, of work out there in the field is still SDJR and initial soil survey. That's not changing at all. But we know that we need to start developing some new tools, and techniques, uh, procedures, standards, uh, databases, demonstrations in order to get ready for when this becomes more of a reality for more concentrated work in the future. I do believe that this is the next uh, really big phase in soil survey work is to be able to better identify uh, where components of soils and types of soils are within our uh, existing SERGO data. It doesn't really replace any of that data. It just enhances it. It gives us a way to complement the data that are already out there and to give more information on soils to the public and to our own agency, which is really what we're all about. So sit back, relax, listen, and learn, and get ready to be prepared for a little future look. I will turn this over to Tom DeBello and Travis Nauman. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, as you noticed, uh, you've got two names up there, so it's going to be kind of a tag team effort, and we're just going to uh, switch. So, so you hear my voice. I'm Tom DeBello, and I'm Travis Nauman, and we're both here at WVU uh, at Morgantown. So, what are we going to talk about today? As Dave mentioned, we'll go over disaggregation again and again. As part of that, to drive it home, we'll be looking at uh, kind of three widely varying areas. We'll summarize it, and then there is a uh, list of references provided that we won't go over, but it's there in the presentation so that you can look at it when you're at your leisure. So what is spatial disaggregation? Well, as Dave mentioned, it's the next big opportunity as part of the National Cooperative Soil Survey. It's our opportunity to add some value to the survey of product. Uh, you can look at a maybe a more formal definition that Amanda Moore put together, but we're looking to get more detail. You know, doing some spatial refinement of maps and you know, the attempt is to reflect the level of detail that people are putting. Uh, by now. And with that, you know, get that corresponding increase in the resolution of our uh, attribute data. And these are demands that are being placed on our current products. That's kind of the next stage that we need to go towards. You know, the simplest way to think about this aggregation is just you know, identification of components within that piece. Uh, We've already got map units out there that are designed as complex to associations with uh, multiple components. Uh, it's also been done in a demonstration format in Alaska. So it's more like an order three or an order four effort up in Denali National Park. And again, you know, the modeling community seems to be one of the drivers towards doing this, but in general, We've got better data, we've got better software, and our mission all along has been to take what we've got in a soil survey product and uh, continually improve on it. <clears throat> and, you know, as part of that, we've always done a pretty good job of describing, telling people what's there. We tell them where it's at, but we really haven't done a good job of showing them where it's at. And I think it's 
is that you know improved spatial definition and uh, we're having a soil cover that will help us uh, one tell where things are at, two spur more information and research into why that pattern occurs where it does, and uh, how that system behaves. So as the United States before, we're talking about a refinement of the uh, landscape. And I'm talking the landscape as a whole, the soilscape. So all the soil forming parameters, not just uh, terrain parameters. And just like uh, you know, our present day soil survey, along with the spatial comes the attribute. They really can't be separated. So an improvement in one should have a likewise corresponding improvement in the other. And really everything is related to SPJR. We didn't call it that 20 or 30 years ago, but uh, you know, there was an attempt to uh, do the same types of things. You know, and any effort that we do comes down to what is it that we want to know and how extensive uh, the problem is that we want to address. Are we dealing with just one map unit? Are we dealing with a suite of map units like a Katina? Or are we dealing with all the map units within a project area, within an MLRA, within some type of uh, natural unit? And that's part of what we'll do here. You know, we'll try to address those things in three different areas. You know, as part of the work that Travis and I have done on this is to uh, get some feedback from local soil scientists, see how they feel about their current maps, look at some different digital techniques, evaluate the results from the digital techniques, and uh, see how that rests with the uh, soil scientists. And ultimately, we'll be looking at developing materials and guidelines. So people in project soil survey offices and ML offices will uh, just kind of start doing this stuff in second nature. So as kind of a uh, head from the beginning, I uh, wanted to show you uh, part of some of the early efforts at uh, implementing desegregation procedures in West Virginia. This work was done by Dr. James Thompson and some others here in West Virginia about two years ago. And you can see on the left um, a couple large associations in uh, West Virginia. And they use just uh, simple rules from the map unit narratives to break those apart into component soils um, using some uh, elevation um, derivatives. And you can see that on the right. So I just want to give you a visual early on here before we start throwing terms around and whatnot. So um, some of the early work. And what we want to, another thing we want to stress is that this is, this is a workflow. This is just kind of an approach to you know, any kind of project you would um, you approach, uh, you know, desegregation might sound a little cryptic, but really we, we're just trying to evaluate some goals or needs to address, figure out what the scope is um, for those, figure out what data we have that can help us achieve that, choose, choose a method to uh, implement that, and then use the right tools to implement, and then go back when we're done and validate and see if we need to iterate through the, the prior steps to to improve on, on uh, where, we, where we are at. So for some of the current uh, work in West Virginia, uh, our goals for this project were to try and um, map soil series on a field scale. And our scope was to look at all the map units in two project areas in West Virginia, Pocahontas and Western County. And we started to use 30 meter uh, digital elevation models, Landsat geo cover, satellite imagery, uh, lithology map, and the original circular data. And so for methodology, we, we chose to to look at um, Sergo and create rules from uh, from mapping descriptions in Sergo in the database and implement a classification tree ensemble uh, to, to come up with a final um, desegregation prediction map, essentially, which we'll get, we'll get into more. Our implementation, so pretty common software out there. We, um, we use Access, uh, GIS, ArcGIS mostly, um, and Python, and you can also do uh, use R for the modeling side of things. And 
right here, we have a fraction of uh, conifer so it's what the first variable on top represents. And so you split on that, if you go left, if you're below that split, you go next to another rule where you have profile curvature. So if, you have, if you're greater than that number, then you go left, and you end up with an inceptosome. Um, so that's kind of basic um, explanation on a classification tree. Um, there's some other stuff out there that's a little more specialized, area of point interpolations, where you can um, implement some geostatistical methods when you have both point data to do profile data and you have your polygons. Um, but we won't get into that much. Just, just saying it because it's out there. Um, so then you get to kind of the last step of, um, of this workflow we're presenting, which you implement and then validate uh, your results. So, um, basically, we're creating a raster disaggregation map. Um, and on the right here is, an, is a <clears throat> part of the study where we did that in West Virginia. And you can see the different colors represent disaggregated soil series types, and the black lines overlaying those are the original circular polygons. And then for the validation, we had, in this case, um, independent head-ons, and these are all represented by the balloons. There you see they kind of mark those locations. And uh, we have a list of results here in the bottom left. Um, we use different specialist parts, so you can do exact matches or you can try and, you know, account for some spatial area and look at a radius around a validation of head-ons. So you can see kind of some varying results looking for light soils. And then because we ran multiple trees, you can also look in the underlying ensemble and see if part of your model matched or not. Um, probably more detail than we want to get into here. But uh, there's different ways to get at how you validate, and it depends on what your goals are. Um, and part of the point is when we were digging around, um, looking at uh, all the different surveys that we're trying to improve, we uh, ran into some cool historical stuff and some names you guys might recognize. Tom actually uh, found this, and we are looking through some old uh, soil surveys we have here in our uh, uh, department library. Yeah, I was close to shock when I looked at some of those names. I, I, I guess I just wasn't expecting to see those guys, but uh, it's pretty neat when you think about it. And uh, I really don't look at what we're doing as anything different than what we've been doing for the past hundred years. We just have. Uh, some different tools and some different data to allow us to do it. So, we kind of talked about the Allegheny Plateau area, but that's pretty fair relief. Uh, in the Corn Belt, we're dealing with a little bit different goal. Uh, that will be a local example. Uh, they're particularly interested in components of phases within a couple map units. Uh, in this case, just those map units within one county. And the primary data set that we had was the three meter DEM. And like uh, was just presented, we're looking at expert rules, classification tree, and similar similar suite of software to uh, you know help us sort all that out. <clears throat> Specifically, we're looking at the identification of non bonded and bonded phases in stable map units. Typically, I think those are mapped uh, as bonded, but uh, there's a suspicion that maybe some of it's not bonded. And likewise, the I paid is associated with stable, and uh, was, effort was to see if that ladder could be used to pick up some of the poorly drained components within that. Now, for scope and why are we doing it in Peoria County, the main thing is uh, the availability of the high-resolution DEMs. Uh, stable and unpaid the soils are expensive, a couple, couple million acres, uh, highly productive, and Peoria County sits right in the heart of uh, that. So it's a good representative landscape, and we figured we could come up with uh, a good area to run some tests to see what works. And the lighter eventually gets delivered to the whole state, They'll be able to, uh, you know, implement something like this across the entire extent of uh, whatever series they feel like working with. Uh, 
is greatly exaggerated. But just to give you an idea, I mean, it's flat. Uh, as far as the terminology, we're talking about uh, taps and dips and rises. So it's flat, flat country. As part of this, rather than trying to figure out things ahead of time, we just put together every particular type of uh, terrain derivative that may have some potential impact. All of these things could be created with stuff that uh, people have on their computer right now, or if not, it's all CCE certified. So common software, common techniques, and, uh, you know, kind of using that as a potential set of predictors, of proxies, uh, do an expensive sample of an existing survey, and run it through a classification tree. And the whole purpose for that is to, uh, you know, let the spatial data be the driver for this and kind of take, oh, uh, that totally removed, you know, the tacit process, but uh, introduce something that's a little bit more objective, more repeatable, and uh, ultimately more precise. Uh, the purpose of using a classification tree, I mean, one of them was just as a data mining uh, tool so that we can efficiently determine, you know, potential predictors. And once that's done, you know, what would be the corresponding thresholds? And uh, it's a pretty practical tool that could probably be implemented and really what's it do? The bottom line is you take a set of data over here and the classification tree kind of pumps it out. I kind of think of it like a data sieve. Uh, we're looking at the list of 20 plus and now we've really only got to worry about three of them. And we'll kind of briefly walk you through this tree. <clears throat> so like, you know, Travis was shown with the West Virginia example. Classification tree will recursively go through this data set and pick the best data sets that help in splitting. And they will help. They will get you the optimal data sets that help in uh, determining where you're saving on that data occur. It represents it in this form that they call a classification tree. So, uh, yeah, at the top here, that's, that's one of those variables, altitude above channel network, uh, relative position or elevation, some folks might know that as. That's another data set, so there's a split there. And then the question depth or sink depth here. And I guess, you know, one of the advantages of a classification tree is Everyone's heard of a black box, you know, a statistical technique or a mathematical technique that's called a black box, like uh, artificial intelligence. You don't really know what's going on. All you see is an answer. And if someone asks you to explain it, you really couldn't, you know, unless you were one of the guys that invented you know, the technique. Uh, the classification tree is a white box. It's sitting right out there in front of you. It's uh, something that's easy to understand, easy to explain, and uh, the data requirements are less stringent than some of the other statistical techniques. So, uh, you know, if you don't have a normal distribution, uh, it's not much of a problem. Uh, you know, all of those tedious data transformations that are sometimes required uh, don't present themselves with a classification degree. Now, just to give you a graphic example of what happens when we go through these splits. So, using that threshold of 0.25, everything that's greater is in red, everything that's less is blue. Likewise, at this split, with relative position, the red's the high stuff, the blue is the low stuff. And when we look at sink depth or depression depth, the red stuff is deep. Probably not likely a depression. The shallower stuff, uh, based on this threshold, is depression. When you throw it all together into a uh, fuzzy or a crisp classifier, it really doesn't matter. That's kind of the way, you know, the 
first tough will go with the implementation of uh, the rules for my classification. And just kind of out of curiosity, you know, I wanted to see how well do those predicted servo units match up with the existing servo. And, and not just that. And really the whole reason for doing this, you know, even though I stated the goal in this process was components within Sable, components within Ava, for the most part, all of this was done to get a uh, broad overview and assessment and kind of get a handle on, you know, how well the soils fit the landscape, uh, are there outliers, is, is there overlap, are there series out there that pretty much occupy the same data space. And, uh, you know, so that was all kind of done as a precursor. Ultimately, if the go in and run something like depression depth, Depression cross surface, and then just do simple zone statistics based on the thresholds that were initially selected. 41% of this table comes out as positive. Now, those thresholds could be adjusted up or down, get a little more liberal or conservative, uh, you know, take there, and that's that 41% would go over now. And bear in mind, at this point, not a lot of field verification has been done, but uh, that, that's something that will be forthcoming. Now, that was 3 meter elevation data. Since the 10 meters out there, people usually ask, hey, how does the 10 meter perform? Uh, not very well in this type of setting. You know, when you're talking situation where just a couple of feet of relief controls everything in a catena, and a 10 meter DEM is just kind of painting things with too broad a brush. So doing that same thing, that same simple thing with the idea bunch, looking at brush and cost service, brush and depth, 9% uh, of the area is bonded or poorly drained. So, yeah, the idea there would be to go out and verify this, pick the threshold that really seems to be working well, and then identify those soils and see if they happen to be, you know, the commonly mapped, poorly drained component in the uh, data unit. Now, once that's done, uh, the office will have, you know, pretty good information to go in and update the component table. Uh, they could rename map unit phases if needed. And the big question in all of this is, you know, what is reasonable to improve the product? It's like how good or how bad do things have to be to make an improvement? And uh, I guess that's the big question in all of this disaggregation work. And maybe sit in the back of some people's minds is, all right, we haven't addressed the whole, kind of, the whole concept of adding lines is off limits at this point in time. If in the future that gets opened up where people could do that, that raster data set is always sitting there and uh, that could be used to help split things out further. So now I'm moving uh, quite a bit west and south and uh, a lot drier as well. Uh, and show you a little bit of work for in Arizona, um, just from some of my master's um, degree projects. And uh, our goals for that were a little different. I wasn't actually working to directly fit target, so we just wanted to see how um, we could use uh, different uh, environmental factors to try and match soil forming factors and, and match those to soil types. Um, so the scope of what we looked at uh, was the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument Survey, which is down along uh, the Arizona-Mexico border in the Sonoran Desert. And uh, the data we used to get at this was a digital elevation model, again, at the USGS 30-meter uh, uh, DEM and aster satellite imagery to try and represent topography, vegetation, and geology. And we used an unsupervised classification uh, 
to basically include me to this data um, and implement that in Erdat's match in RGIS to try and match with uh, those groupings with soil text, basically just mapping it down there. And we validated it by using a contingency table to see how well matching it and our class is correlated to each other. Um, but kind of as a side product, we found that when we tried to optimize um, our classification by changing the number of classes that we that we told it to, to group for us and whatnot, we found that um, when we optimized it, we found um, a separation of components in um, most of the complex map units in, uh, in an organ pipe. And um, so uh, this is just kind of uh, looking at, uh, at one of our classifications there and kind of wanted to focus on uh, this uh, big fan unit in the bottom right here. And uh, basically we have kind of two groups of uh, classes. The different colors are the cluster classes. So you see this uh, kind of more purple-blue unit and then the more light-blue areas. Those, are, those actually matched up with the two components in this, uh, uh, in this um, map unit quite well. And we, we saw that in a lot of other areas around this too. And so basically what we got is we could use um, these different environmental covariates to, to not only try and correlate to the original map units, but break them into component, um, components as well. And so what we're planning on doing is um, we have another trial that we've been, we've been trying to get rolling in northeastern Arizona. We have a, a lot of initial spatial data and are compiling it. We'll be doing some model runs using methods similar to the West Virginia pilot um, as kind of a trial on this type of landscape and um, uh, you know, much different environment, obviously. Uh, so hopefully we'll have uh, some more results on that um, coming up pretty soon. And just to kind of summarize what we've gone through, we have these three different kind of case studies that we're trying to exemplify this workflow process of, you know, basically this aggregation to spatially refine our data. And um, to have different scopes, um, you know, either the entire survey, entire survey area, well, multiple entire surveys for, for West Virginia, uh, real specific questions in, uh, in Illinois, um, the haunted versus non-haunted, and just looking at environmental groupings and how those compare to what we've mapped in, in Arizona. Um, we've used uh, relatively similar data sources that are pretty widely available across all these projects. This is There's a lot of other data out there. I want to stress that. Um, and... Uh, but, but these, these basic data sets seem to cover a lot. With um, so our methods, we've done a lot of um, trying to figure out rules for components and how we match those to the covariates. Um, classification trees, both from our work and in literature, tend to uh, be used a lot, as well as clustering techniques. There's papers out that have used um, clustering in more targeted ways for, for soil survey update type of work. Um, implementation. So most of the software you see here, I think most people listening probably have access to or could get access to there'd be access, ArcGIS, uh, Python and R, both open source and I believe um, certified. And uh, so these are these are tools that we can all use. There's, you know, there's learning curves to them, but but they're available. Uh, validation. There's you know. The more point data we can use to validate, the better we really know. But um, we can also, you know, look at it. people who know the soils, know the soils, and they can look at these things and help help refine them. Um, and just as highlights, you know, um, for the, the West Virginia data, we were able to do create a soil series map and well, actually harmonizing two soil surveys that had some artifacts at the edges. And we can maintain similar accuracy between the actual disaggregated product and the original surgical product. We use that validation set to kind of test both of those. Um, Illinois, it looks like we're going to be able to pick out fine scale depressions to get at drainage um, better. And uh, in Arizona, we're able to start hanging at being able to detect components. So a lot of good stuff um, with promise for the future. And in, in further summary, we're just, I want to stress that this is, you know, this is a cryptic, this is just a process to, to improve our data. Um, there's a tremendous amount of new data sources out there and computing abilities. 
that we can incorporate into our, our survey products to add a lot of value. And we, as we disaggregate, um, move into doing this, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll really hope to be able to improve the, the detail, you know, of our maps um, without having to collect a whole lot of new data. Um, and, uh, but, of course, the more data we have, the more the better we can validate and know how well we're doing. Um, we can get more realistic representations of soil distribution, uh, in my opinion. Um, and with a lot of the modeling techniques, we can also sort of turn those into continuous representations by incorporating probabilities. Um, and um, in the future, uh, we, we, we can use these procedures to, to be able to update um, our mapping products a lot quicker because we have, with all this new, when, as we collect new field data and new environmental data, new satellite imagery, the elevation models become available, we can rerun these models to be able to perpetually update this data. So that makes, that turns, that turns our data into more of a, uh, a much, much easier, um, a much easier product to, to keep updating. Um, so the next steps for us here, um, we're going to try, some of the work we're going to do this summer, we're going to try and match this aggregated data to actual, actual ecological sites. And uh, what we think is that if we can start taking this aggregated data and then, also, and then um, figuring out how to match that up with ecological sites spatially and check that in the field, we think we'd be able to even do, uh, we'd be able to do even better because a lot of the imagery out there is going to pick up um, pick up more of that fact community side of things. And so and that ties us together with the ecological community better, and um, uh, which would be, could add a lot of value to our products because we can start mapping at the state or community level, which we could start using more directly in conservation plans. Um, we're currently submitting an article for peer review for West Virginia study, so that'll be out um, soon in the next year, hopefully. And uh, moving into kind of our literature, I'm not going to go through this, but it's going to be available for anybody who wants to do a little bit more research on their own. So with that, uh, we will open it up to questions and um, see what we have to start with here. And again, for questions, you use your Q&A tab on the live meeting frame, type that in, and I'll take questions from that list. Okay, the first question is, uh, and I will paraphrase, you know, just to get a little bit quicker, but you know, rule-based approaches are time-consuming, they're limited by the spatial extent, and highly dependent on tacit knowledge. So, are the various landscape or landform algorithms out there, such as Spit, Hewitt, Iwash, and Pike, and so forth, uh, could they be used to allow disaggregation at regional and even national scales? And I'll give the simple answer, and I, I would say yes, but uh, Travis will give a more detailed answer, maybe. Yeah, I would concur with that. I, that was one of the things we tried to do with this multiple survey area study in West Virginia was say, how can we kind of streamline some of the manual desegregation um, rule sets that, that Thompson um, set up in the earlier study? And we, so we can kind of rule match right out of the database to stuff like you need to do it. Um, and you can, do, you can do a lot more a lot quicker that way because like, you can automate a lot of things. You can match different uh, values and raster's to different soil landscape descriptions. So, like, you know, a back slope, you can there's you can map a or you can match that directly to Smith Hewitt. So, yes, I would say so. Um, all right. Part of the beauty of uh, the work Travis did in West Virginia is the let's say total automation, but compared to many of the other Techniques you might read about, it was uh, a fair amount of automation as far as determination of the setting, geographic setting of some of these things. So, 
Uh, the next question is, will a typical soil survey office be able to conquer the learning curve? I, I think so, sure. I mean, it's going to take a little bit of time because, I mean, the things that you read in the literature, some of the things we've been talking about today, they're not the typical things that people get presented with during their undergraduate years. And uh, we're just now in the agency starting to, you know, unveil some of this information. So, uh, you know, I would say a number of the soil scientists that have, you know, graduated with a master's in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, they're, they're right into the thick of this stuff. So I just think it'll be something that will take a little bit of time. But eventually, sure, I think a number of these things, uh, They'll wind up becoming routine. Uh, probably 15 years ago, GIS was a big issue. And uh, now people really don't think much about some of the more common things that you can do with GIS. So I think this will just be one more of those. Okay. I, I, I agree. I think, I think these skill sets are becoming more and more common and that we, if we organize ourselves correctly, it, it can usually be a soil survey office um, procedure. Um, but <laughs> so we'll move on to the next question here. Hopefully we cover that. Um, so how many independent ground truth observations would be needed to determine physical confidence in component separation? This is a good question. A lot of people are trying to address uncertainty in, in these kind of um, this kind of modeling and really depends on how well your, I'm going to have to say it depends on how well your environmental covariates are using to, to, to get at component location, how well they actually correlate to those components. And so it's going to vary. Um, and uh, I think the literature is, uh, I think research is still yet to come out that really addresses that. And it's really going to vary from region to region. I mean, you have some reasons we have a lot of variability. It's going to be take a lot more points if you want to have a certain level of confidence. Um, so I don't think I, I can quite answer that question as of now. Uh, anything to say about that, Tom? Uh, I don't think I would touch that, Larry. <laughs> really, it seems to me that everything has come down to more a matter of how many do we need to obtain a certain level of uh, accuracy or precision? It's more like how many can we afford to go out and take and then just report the results. Uh, that seems to be more of it. And we, we can do, like with the West Virginia project, we actually did create a confidence surface. It might not be, the numbers in that surface might not be as high as you want them. But, yeah. uh, but, all right, so let's see what we have next year. Uh, got a question about our guest ID and when it will be available. Uh, Can I interrupt? We've got a question here. Yeah, in the room. Sure. I have a question for you. In the previous statement a minute ago, you made a very important point uh, to the question of how much validation is necessary. You really don't have an answer, bad answer for that, which is reasonable. But uh, I think Tom's comment that <clears throat> it's, uh, it's uh, how much do you need versus how much can you afford. If in this process you don't have an extremely robust ground truthing process as an integral part of this whole initiative, then you're just making pretty maps, which may or may not be true. And that has to be a very vigilant uh mention to what is done because if you don't, the tendency is going to be to say in the time of, of uh, approval budgets and such not, to downsize and say, well, we really can't get out there. We'll just do a little bit and check it and there's the results. That's not good enough because we can all make pretty maps. You've got the tools to generate a lot of imagery and a lot of splits and they may be plausible, but you won't know whether they're credible or not unless there is a robust ground truthing dimension to what you do. And I know that it's been mentioned, but I, in this process, these skills become available. It's not 
but sufficient to simply generate a pretty map. I agree with you completely, and um, I will, that's definitely a, um, a topic of kind of the next steps we're taking in the research here. And and, even, and, and when that that uh, when that paper comes out that we're publishing, and if you want if you want more information on that on the West Virginia study, it starts to get it what you're talking about, how we actually ground truth this stuff. Um, so I agree with you completely. Yeah, you won't get any arguments. But I don't think we're saying uh, take the old stuff and throw it out. Here's the new stuff. So I don't, I don't think we're destroying anything. Uh, what we presented. Uh, question about our SIE and when it will be available. Anticipated certification, CC certification is middle to late March. That's the best I can say about that. Uh, let's see. The DPM in Illinois was a three-meter DPM and uh, downloadable from Spatial Data Gateway. I think at the time that I downloaded it, the uh, USGS click site, that's probably where I got it. But it's publicly available, uh, three-meter data derived from LIDAR. And USGS, they do... They, they publish vertical accuracy. You have to dig into the metadata, um, but as far as the yeah. actual accuracy of the elevation values themselves, um, and usually, I don't know if I had... Yeah, I can't answer that off the yeah. top of my head. Probably be with plus or minus 10 or 20 feet would be my guess um, for an RMSE. Um, but, again, you want to check the metadata on that for whatever product you're using. Uh, the next question. How do you decide which derivatives to use in Illinois going from 20 to 3? That was kind of the, uh, I guess we call it the shotgun approach. So it was the classification tree, really, that kind of acted like a data sieve. So there are 20 plus inputs, and, you know, the response were these sample points. Where do we have the various soils located? And it's that uh, classification tree that actually does the work of going through and sorting out and uh, making the determination of which variables are the best at partitioning out what soils occur as a function of uh, various thresholds of the data sets. So it takes a lot of that qualitative stuff, uh, I guess, out of the picture. You don't need to wade through things. And, and then, you know, depending on what method you use, there, I mean, there's other physical methods you can use. Right. You can look at correlations uh, to your derivatives, you know, whatever your environmental data is to your classes, or you can look at, or that would be more for property, or you could look at, um, uh, there's, there's it, it kind of depends on what you're using. I mean, if you're using a, like a logistical regression, you can use stepwise um, multiple logistical regression. There's, there's a lot of ways. It just depends on your approach. But in this case, it was the classification tree um, approach gives you that. It helps you narrow them down. Um, so it's a, it's a nice tool for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, th this question uh, relates back to Mark Crouch's. And that was, uh, you know, are, are people going to be able to implement these kinds of things in a typical soil survey office? So if you look at the suite of some of the training that's available, there's spatial analyst training that, you know, we want people to take through uh, the ESRI online. Dwayne Daniels builds on that with a one-day thing. There's an introduction to digital soil map. Course, there's a uh, remote sensing for soil survey application course, and there's a digital soil mapping with ArcSIE course. So that's five classes that uh, kind of set a foundation for introducing some of these techniques. And, uh, 
Yeah, budgets have been kind of an issue for the past several years, but uh, all of those classes have been offered at least two to three times. So with any luck, it'll be a yearly thing. So, I mean, the agency has been making a you know, concerted effort to try to, uh, you know, provide the tools and the training for uh, our staff. There's a question about how does this fit in the six-year plan for SDJR. That's probably a question for Dave. Who yeah, that's about uh, that's definitely what my big thing. Um, so I can't uh, talk. Yeah, the SDJR we've, is we've got some of a fight on that. To more fully complete and get a more fully complete, fully populated database for each of our components, so that that information can be used in order to do this step of disaggregation. That's how it fits in. That's DJR. That's true. That's that's I mean, my bad answer on that. Yeah, that would make that would make sense to me. I mean, the more consistent our attribute data is and our attribution of our mapping system, well, in theory, the more consistent and the better um, results we have with this aggregation. So, yeah, I agree. A uh, question about the concern that during the current phase of SDJR, uh, will there be a loss of information that's critical to this disaggregation concept? So kind of like uh, re-correlating away. <laughs> it is some of that uh, information that may be helpful. If it's, if it's done well, it will help. If it's not done well, it won't help. Well, we're striving for that. We're striving for that as a done well approach. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, it should it, it should help, um, and hopefully there's no information lost along the way. Uh, I have a question on was there some of the work that was done in Great Smoky Mountain National Park? And there was. And was, to be honest, there's not been a whole lot of information that uh, was related to that, probably because I don't think they were really very happy with their results. And uh, I suppose one of could. There may be reasons why that is. I'm not, I'm not going to comment as to the reasons uh, why. You didn't hear much about it. I mean, one of them is they were dealing with the soil landscape relationships that really weren't that predictable. And uh, so these modeling techniques really didn't work. Whether that's the way things were or not, I'm not sure. I wasn't involved with that project. A question about cartographic standards relating to minimum, minimum delineation size and how that relates to um, desegregation and how have these standards been adhered to in the case studies. Um, my, my goal was, field, was a field scale map, so um, the reality is I did not adhere to that standard. Um, and in well, at least in the map units that, that I was working with, um, if you go, if you look at the actual manuscripts themselves, you know, a lot of the stuff that's too too small to be included in that in the map units is uh, listed as inclusions. And what we found is that um, we can actually start mapping those inclusions. And so, if we don't need to have a minimum mapping size, then why should we have a minimum mapping size? And that's part of the reason to go to uh, rasterized desegregation um, type of product if you can. So um, I, I, I sense concurrence from Tom. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a number of issues that need to be brought up also with the raster world. You know, I mean, just because uh, we may be doing our modeling work with five meter resolution data, and there's one little long five meter pixel out there, 
how much confidence do we have in saying that the class that's predicted is actually the class that is. So, yeah, I mean, really, it pretty much comes back to, uh, I think it was Phil's comment, you don't really know until you know, and you don't know until you make that, you know, physical observation. So, but the rest of the data model does give us a little more flexibility. I got a question on how do classes of curvature and slope compare to Schmidt and Hewitt? Now that Schmidt and Hewitt is a uh, it's a AML that runs in Arc Info Grid, and it you know it takes slope and curvature, and the user puts a couple of parameters in, and then it'll go out to find uh, landforms, and uh, that. Well, of course, I didn't use that in Illinois because anywhere that you get in the world where you're dealing with low, re low relief, uh, nothing really that anyone's come up with uh, works except some of the uh, more simple things. So Schmidt and Hewitt, Hewitt was not even attempted there. But, uh, you know, Travis might have some comments as to how we like the uh there, there are, I mean, there are some other ways of classing out landscapes that people have um, put out there for, you know, landforms. Um, I don't know really have a good list off the top of my head, but, there, but they are out there. Um, the Schmidt and Hewitt, I, if, you, if you play with the, the window sizes and some of the parameters, you can make it work for a lot of different scales of, of topography, um, which in some ways makes it a little more subjective than, than one might like. But um, I think if you if you go out there and look um, in the literature, you'll find some other approaches. I mean, the thing is, you know, the, the question of comparing curvature and slope grids to Smith-Hewitt, Smith-Hewitt is a classification of curvature and slope. So, um, that is, so really it's just how you, how you scale that um, within the Schmidt Hewitt framework. But um, I, I think, first I think the, the low, the low relief areas are tricky and we're still quite working on that. I think if you, if you tweak to the Schmidt Hewitt um, AML window size correctly, you can still make it work pretty good for taller mountains too, but I haven't played with it, with it too much in really big uh, areas with really, really big mountain slopes, so I might not be the best, uh, best one to answer that question at this point. Okay, let's start another question here. So how does this research differ from UW-Madison, um, Dr. Zhu, um, and so on. Uh, well, really, I think all of it's related when it comes down to it, and it's all related to doing soil survey the old-fashioned way. I mean, if you look at uh, the tools that we've got available to do the soil survey, I, I think the aerial photo and stereo photography was the most revolutionary thing. And we've not even come up with anything close to that type of uh, breakthrough since then. And that was in the late 1930s. But I mean, now that we're getting higher resolution elevation data, higher resolution imagery, so spectral resolution and spatial resolution, uh, it's all just part of that same thing. You know, it, it's all part of looking at the soil forming factors and uh, trying to come up with ways that uh, define it better. So, you know, Ajing and what they did at UW-Madison, I think that's just part of the suite of, uh, you know, what we've talked about today and any of the things that uh, weren't discussed today but are included in that with the literature. Yeah, I mean, we, we build on a lot of the concepts from, from Solon. I mean, Solon, you're basically just defining the membership function. So what you define what environmental layer you have and how how that relates to a given soil type. And so, I mean, that, 
and help during the geospatial validation and evaluation step. And I think, uh, sure, uh, I think the idea there is, you know, one could go about, you take uh, the example that Travis presented. So he's, he's applying that model universally. So the servo polygons are still sitting there. They're not going anywhere. But you apply that model universally, or for that matter, take that, uh, if that image is in your mind of uh, orbit pipe, that 3D thing. You got the circle lines sitting there, and you got that fan coming down, and there were some little purple blobs and some tan blobs and some bluish blobs. Uh, those blobs were the models. The circle lines went black. So, sure, a uh, person could intersect that, and, uh, you know, at the polygon level, there would be information on components within each polygon. Or any of the other data sets, whether it's, you know, slope curvature, whatever, that could be carried within each polygon. So that could be, uh, I guess, a technique that, that could be uh, explored. And it looks like there is one last comment. Nearest neighbor will stretch high slope into low slope and vice versa. Uh, Not sure if that's a, an issue of, you know, the, the method that one uses when they're resampling an elevation model, but uh, I guess if it is, yeah, you definitely need to be aware of whether you're using a nearest neighbor or a bilinear or cubic convolution. And I think in any of the data that Travis and I spoke of, uh, we were only dealing with you know, bilinear or cubic convolution if we uh, resampled any of our data. So I'm not sure if I'm answering that question, but it's quite a reference to how you change the flow. Yeah, there are other issues about when you use certain tools that it'll tell us something a little bit like it has more or less flow than it really does. But that's it's really something you have to kind of look at whatever method you're using in your JS package and then go to and think about how it actually works in order to figure that out. We're all ways of talking for a different a different webinar. Well and definitely it's a good question or a good point. You know, neighborhood size, uh, arc SIE and graphs uh, both have neighborhood size as a variable and you can set that parameter. But you know, the output is a function of that uh, neighborhood sites, you know, the window sites. So yeah. you get a little bit of that shifting going on. Uh, nothing winds up being perfect. Well, Tom and Travis, I want to thank you for your presentation and answering questions today, and thank all of you that have listened online and submitted questions. Again, this webinar was recorded and is available, will be available online at webinars, presentations, and training sessions at our website, soils.usda.gov slash education, slash resources, slash videos dot html. And that concludes our presentation today. Thanks all. Thanks. You.